the Evolution Security Podcast. The subconscious mind is the source of your skills and power to perform. All great performances are accomplished subconsciously without much conscious thought. We develop skills through repetition of conscious thought until the subconscious mind automatically performs them. That is a quote from the book With Winning in Mind from Olympic and world champion Lanny Basham. Now, we'll talk about him a little bit more here, but at first here, we would like to welcome you, the audience, to the Evolution Security Podcast. This is Aaron Davis, and my co-host tonight is Brian Schilt. How are you doing, buddy? Good, man. Always good to get together. Oh, yeah. We're, we're missing Eric tonight. He is actually traveling, so a, a little bit of behind the scenes movie magic kind of thing sometimes we do interviews and then our intros and such at different times so that's that's kind of what's going on here so yeah we're missing eric tonight but he'll be back next episode now i would like to go ahead and give some gratitude again to our audience you know we love getting to do this show it's we all love podcasts to begin with so we We all really never thought we would do this, but now we get to do it, and we absolutely love it. We do it because we love to learn, and we love to get better. We love to get, um, we love to increase our happiness. We love to um, better our health, and that's what this show is all about, and it's doing it together. So, again, we hope you in the audience benefit likewise as we do, as we learn from these subject matter experts that we have on the show and and as we learn from each other, too. So, Brian, I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to you. At at this point, we'd like to give some gratitude to our sponsors. Oh, absolutely. And uh, I'll just got a couple I'll go through here real quick. Of course, uh, we've got Tenacore that's been with us since the beginning, and I I use my Velo holster every time I shoot drills and train. And I'll be ordering uh, a new Kurtum 3 here shortly that uh, will give me the ability to have a strong side inside the waist and small the back carry option as well because those are modalities that I would like to also, you know, pump up and use. But uh, regardless of where you like to carry or how you like to carry, they make excellent products here in the U.S., right here at home, and their employees work here. Their designing is done here. Their revisions are done here. All of the molding and folding happens right here. And that's that's just one of the reasons we love them. Another reason is they just make excellent products. So if you would like to make a purchase there um, or just check out their stuff and take a look at what they offer, the website is tenacore.com, T-E-N-I-C-O-R, tenacore.com. And for 10% off of your purchase, Use the code EVOSEC, E-V-O-S-E-C, at checkout. And the other one we want to shout out to is Origin of Maine. Obviously, they uh, they make some outstanding, world-class clothing, apparel, gis, compression gear, all of the Jocko line supplements. And trust me, I love my Monk. I have it every morning after my workout. And I'm also using one of their... Um, trade brands, one of their origin trademarked brands, the Hypnos uh, Sleep Aid. And let me tell you, I actually have been sleeping better with it. So I will I will be wow. giving a shout out to them and probably writing a review on it because I do have some trouble getting to sleep sometimes and staying asleep. And uh, it has actually been very helpful. And I feel like I'm more rested when I get up in the morning from using it. Also, using their Zeus Test which is actually a all natural herbal testosterone optimizer and I'm 
I don't want to say I'm feeling amazing benefits, but I do feel like I've got a little bit more drive in my workout and just a little bit more push, you know, and that's, that's, that's what that should provide. So, um, again, they, they have a wide line of products and supplements and, uh, obviously the Jocko labeled products, but, uh, they have others as well. So go on and give them a look at originmain.com. That's O R I G I N main.com, just like the state. And again, if you'd like 10% off of your order, use the code EVOSEC10, E-V-O-S-E-C-1-0, EVOSEC10 at checkout for 10% off. Outstanding companies and products that we believe in, stand by, and use every day. And that's why they're on our show. So there you go. And I'll, I'll, I'll hand it back to you, Aaron. Hey, thanks, Brian. Now, I would like to go back to that quote, or at least refer back to that book, With Winning in Mind by Lenny Basham. Let me tell you, there are, there's a nebulous concept that we all, we always hear when it comes to performance, especially in sports, but it's always about, quote, your mental game. And it's all mental. But, you know, again, that's nebulous because no one ever really defines it. But I can tell you, our awesome guest, Um, in this show for this show is Lenny Basham and he articulates the mental game and getting on top of your mental game. He articulates it better than probably anybody we've ever seen. So again, if you don't have that book and if if you've not heard of Lenny Basham, you need to look him up and I promise you, you're going to learn a ton from him and you're going to learn a ton from him on this interview Brian, what do you think? We should go ahead and get into it. You know what? Let's do it. Again, this is a little movie magic because, <laughs> as he alluded, I won't be in the interview, but I'll be back at the end to talk about it. <laughs> Let's do it. Welcome to the show, Lanny. How are you doing this evening? I'm doing good. How about you? Doing wonderful. How are you doing, Aaron? I'm doing great. Excited to be here with Lanny. Well, Lanny... For our audience members that may not know about you, um, go ahead and give us a, a little bit about your um, upbringing and, and what you're about. Well, I was a terrible athlete growing up. Uh, I was probably, arguably, the worst athlete in school. I was slow, short, and uncoordinated and couldn't throw the ball, couldn't catch the ball, couldn't hit the ball. And so, obviously, I didn't get on anybody's team. We're in about sixth grade. And uh, we're studying the Olympics in school, and the teacher makes a statement in class, you know, it's possible somebody in this class could be an Olympic champion someday. And this little boy sitting next to me jumps right up and says, teacher, I don't know who'd have the best chance, but I know who have the worst chance, and that's Lanny. And that kind of kind of ticked me off, and so uh, I came home all upset and I just decided that, you know, I got to do, I got to change this situation where, and, um, nobody wants me on their team. And so my mother hauls me off to the library and started reading books about Olympic athletes and kind of got cooked, hooked on the Olympics as, as just as an, as a thing, you know, it, it, where the best in the world come together once every four years and just see, you know, who's, who's got the goods. And uh, so I, I was excited about that. And one long after that, uh, somebody invited me to a rifle club meeting and I didn't know anything about shooting. We didn't have any guns in the house. My father's a military officer, um, got a battlefield commission on Anzio Beach, and uh, kind of a tough guy. But uh, we fished. We didn't, we didn't shoot. And, uh, and I said, well, tell me about rifle shooting. And he said, well, it's an Olympic sport. And I said, are you sure? Because I didn't, wasn't reading any books and, uh, about Olympic ri- uh, champions or rifle shooters. And uh, he said, oh, yeah. I said, well, how tall do you have to be to be a rifle shooter? <laughs> he said, it doesn't matter how tall you are. And I found a, I found a sport where, where a guy that was maybe, maybe not athletically endowed to, to be a baseball player, football player, basketball player, but probably could do this because he told me that rifle shooting is the only sport in the Olympics where we're trying to make the body stop. So I went to a rifle club meeting. They met every week, and um, I got excited. It was just... Uh, that they let me shoot. I, I enjoyed that. And when my dad took me back the next week, they canceled the program. And uh, 
I, I, I remember remarking to my dad, I said, you know, all these books that I've been reading about these Olympic athletes, they have tremendous uh, obstacles in their way to become an Olympic gold medalist. And I said, uh, I guess my obstacle started out really quick because uh, there's an Olympic sport that I think I can do. And now I got no, they've canceled my program. And my father told me, he says, uh, give me a couple of days. Let me see what I can do. And so he got the keys to an indoor range and uh, nobody was using and began to teach me how to shoot. Only problem was my father didn't know anything about rifle shooting. And he, um, didn't let that stop him. He found out there was a marksmanship unit in the base that we were stationed at. So he'd go find out about shooting, come back, teach me. Uh, Fifteen months later, I'm national junior champion with a rifle in my country. Uh, I, th I think that I don't think I had any special gift for rifle shooting. I think it was uh, uh, more a, a unique situation in the sense that I wasn't, I was in the range by myself for the first half of this period of time. Uh, I had no shooters to copy, but also had no shooters to be discouraged by. I, there's a lot of drama with other people, and I didn't have that. It was just me, and, and I learned how to, how to make me better every day. I mean, I, I wasn't worried about anybody else. I wasn't worried about beating anybody else, competing with anybody. I was just competing with me and training me, and, and so I, I think that was an advantage in a way. And another big advantage, my father was a solution-based coach, meaning that he always talked about the solution, not the problem. And uh, when I shot a bad shot, it wasn't, there's what you're doing wrong. It's here's what you need to do. So I learned that very valuable lesson. But through some circumstances, uh, my father taking over this marksmanship unit and he doing a good job, gets assigned to the Army Marksmanship Unit at Fort Benning. That was pivotal for me. It was a game changer because... The United States of America dominated Olympic rifle shooting at this period of time, and my dad was stationed there. And I go from not seeing any shooters at all to having access to the best in the world because all of our athletes, all of our rifle shooters were in the Army, stationed at the Army Marksmanship Unit. So I got to meet the best in the world and talk to them, and they all had the same story. They all went to college and took out a shooting sports program. They... Uh, we're all Americans in college. They took ROTC. When they came in the Army, they, were, they went to the marksmanship unit. And uh, so that's what I did. And I ended up at the marksmanship unit and, and I did, did pretty well, made the team, and uh, found myself uh, on an Olympic team in 1972 uh, in Munich, Germany. And, uh, and, and I, I thought I was, my, my practice scores were good enough to win the gold medal. And uh, I, I was training with the current world champion my, on my team and where our scores were, were the same. And we went into the competition and I thought there's a lot of pressure on him because he's the famous shooter and I'm not, I've never won anything of, of stature at all. I mean, no national championships, no world championships uh, up to that time. I'd been on the U.S. team for three years, but never really won much. And, and um, he'd won everything. And so the, the, the focus was on him. I thought there's a lot of pressure on this guy. And uh, maybe he'll choke. And well, I, he didn't choke, but I did. And uh, so when I dropped so many points that uh, I didn't think I had a chance at all to win, um, pressure was off, and I, and I shot fine, ended up with the silver. Uh, my teammate won the gold. And I come home realizing that my problem was that I wasn't, I didn't know how to shoot. My problem was I didn't know how to handle the pressure. I didn't have a mental game. And so I started um, looking for help. And I found that the most important help that I got was I just started doing inter interviews with other Olympic champions to find out what they knew about the mental game. Back in those days, we thought that mental toughness was something that you had or didn't have and uh, so we weren't looking to to learn how to do it we didn't think that you could learn mental tr mental skills but when i started interviewing this olympic gold medalist i realized that that's not true that there's, there's a lot of stuff i didn't know and there's a lot of things that i sh that they were doing that i wasn't doing or they knew that i didn't know and after a while i, I saw a system to this and i uh the first opportunity to see if the system would work for me was the World Shooting Championships in 1974. And um, there were actually six world titles available to me in that 
one competition. The World Championships for us and my sport are held every four years. Olympics held every four years. So if you win an individual medal in the World Championships or in the, the Olympics, you have you have a world title, which is what everybody wants. It's kind of like the top tier for my sport. And uh, so I come out of the World Championships with mental management uh, as a uh, as winning three of those six events and uh, meddling in all of them. <coughs> and then two years later, I go to the Olympics, make the Olympic team again from Montreal and win the gold medal in Montreal. And then I started teaching mental management after that. So we're about 40 years into uh, uh, teaching mental performance under pressure to people. Well, Annie, so speaking of your book and mental management, the mental management system, mine and Eric's pistol coach, a gentleman named Mike Brown, who actually took some private lessons from you and is a national champion pistol shooter. He prescribed to my brother um, with winning in mind. And then likewise, my brother prescribed it to me. And of course the subtitle, like you mentioned was um, the mental, the mental management system. Could you describe that a bit? Well, consistency is, is everything in proactive sports. Uh, there's, there's, there's two kinds of sports out there. There's a proactive and reactive. Uh, a, a, a proactive sport is one where, where the athlete initiates the action. Uh, things like archery, rifle shooting, uh, or shooting in general, all shooting sports. Uh, golf is 100% proactive. Some sports are both proactive and reactive. Uh, the uh, a serve in tennis is a proactive element, but when the ball's in play, it's reactive. A, a free throw in basketball is proactive. When the ball's in play, it's reactive. So in a proactive sport, if you want to, uh, the more consistent you are in your form and in your mental process, the, the, better, the better you do. So I, I just looked at it this way. It was kind of like a, a computer program, you know, garbage in, garbage out. So if you, if you have a really good system and you run that system all the time, you, you can ha achieve mental consistency. And, and mental consistency is necessary for you to have technical consistency. And so I, I realized that, that one of the reasons I wasn't winning was because oh, I thought oh, whatever po thought popped into my head. I, did, I had no, no system to, to what I was thinking. I mean, my routine, what I was physically doing was, was pretty consistent. But what I thought about was, was all over the map. Uh, I was more reacting than, than having anything programmed. So if I shot a good shot, I thought one way. If I had a couple of good shots, I thought another way. If I had a couple of bad shots, I guarantee you I thought another way. And so I started counting my score while I was shooting. I mean, I mean there's nothing consistent about all that. And uh, when, when I developed, a, determined the optimum thing to think about before and after a shot, I said, well, I'm going to do that all the time. And when I did that, my scores, my scores skyrocket. So that's uh, a mental system is, uh, if I were to define a mental system, it's, it's uh, determining the optimum thing to think about before, during, and after a task. And if the task is hitting a golf ball or, or, or shooting an arrow or anything that's proactive, uh, that's running a mental system. So the, the mental management system is, is, is our version of that. Now, now, maybe people run something. I mean... Not everybody, I haven't taught everybody yet, but uh, so not everybody's running my system, but if you, if, if you, but, but we think we've, we've designed and refined a pretty good one. And uh, not only have I been able to use it, but uh, we've got clients that uh, have been able to, to use it and, and, and be successful with it as well. So, so we do this full time. I mean, I say we. I've been at this for uh, since 1977. So we're working on almost 40, 44 years, I guess now. And then uh, I have three grown children that uh, work full time as instructors uh, in the, in the program. Uh, and uh, 
So, so it's something that we I've been working on for an awfully long time and refining it. And basically, what the mental management system is 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 what's what should you be thinking about when you're competing so that you have a consistent mental performance under pressure on demand. And that's what we teach. That's what it's all about. So, Lanny, what are some of the types of athletes that you work with? Okay, so. Um, if you're an archer, if you're an Olympic archer, you know who Brady Ellison is. Brady Ellison is the current world champion in, in, in Olympic archery. Uh, he is, he's won uh, Olympic medals. I've been working with him for, since he was a teenager. And, uh, uh, and, and he's, he's number one in the world in what he does. Uh, Todd Bender, if you're, a shot, if you're a skeet shooter in America, you know who Todd Bender is. He he he's uh, he's the number one. He's world. He's the current world champion in in uh, in, in American ski, uh, and he holds more records than any alive person. Runs my program. He's been been working with him for oh I don't know twelve years. Uh, I've had seven PGA Tour players um, win tour events after uh, working with us uh i i, I you know if, if i find give names like fred funk ben crane uh, Ju- uh justin leonard uh people like that uh jerry kelly uh people probably that if you're a golfer you probably know those 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 people we've worked with hundreds of tour, pj tour players uh i i uh as far as, as, as uh, I've, got, I've got world and Olympic champion clients in, in rifle shooting um, and, and shooting in general, most of our clients are guys that want to get better. And, uh, I mean, we, we, we work with the Navy SEALs. We still, we still do some work with them. I've, I've, I've taught at the FBI Academy. Uh, I've worked with the United States Marshal Service. I've taught at the United States Army Marksmanship Unit, middle management there, and the, and the Marines. And... I've worked with Olympic teams all over the. I mean, forty years you do a lot of stuff, and mm. uh, but most of the people that we, most of our clients are are just, they're they're competing in something, but they're not famous, they're not prominent, but they're they're the bread and butter of my work. It's not the famous oh, yeah. guys. Well, I, those are the those are the types of athletes that we are into also. Just as a side note here, one one thing that's really interesting about mental management is that uh, is it that that for a period of years, not so much right now, but for a period of years, the 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 dominant focus in our in our in our business was pro golf because that we were kind of a there was a buzz on on the on the on the pro tour on the PGA tour about about us. We were working. I mean, athletes were coming to us all the time. And everybody's kind of looking for the secret, and you know we were kind of the secret for a while, and uh, and then then uh, but what what's amazing is that that prior uh, a year before two years before that we weren't teaching anybody in golf. So so what happens is that uh, you, and that could happen again with uh, with sports like action pistol and things like that. Rodeo is starting to, to heat up now. Uh, we're starting. We're starting. To, there's a little bit of a buzz out there with us, with ropers and people like that. So uh, all, I'm, all I'm saying is that that we we're not trying to go after any any specific sport. We're just trying to service the people that 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 are, find what we are doing valuable, and to try to make it more valuable. Well, Lanny, one of the athletes that I think you've affected greatly is who my brother mentioned, and that was uh, Mike Brown. I mean, he's he's one of the most uh, accomplished persons I know or people that I know. He was a Division I wrestler. He was obviously, like Aaron said, a national uh, champion shooter in IDPA. And also, even more recent than that, he's had a couple of World Championship medals in ju- in jujitsu. So, uh, wow. he certainly attributes his success to using your methodologies. 
And uh, I mean, he's a hard worker. I mean, I'm no doubt that's a, a huge portion of his success. But he definitely attribute attributes your your uh, mental management system as a huge part of that success. And I mean, I'm no nowhere near his success level. But when he was coaching me many years ago, and, and my audience or our audience has heard this several times, I'm gonna probably stop using this example. Um, but I used it to to move from sharpshooter to expert to master class in IDPA in two months. And and I totally attribute using your directive affirmation statement as probably the biggest contributor along with the rehearsal and or visualization. So so definitively you've affected a lot of people that you may not have realized. So Yeah, well I I I'm happy to know that I, I, uh, we, we certainly, um, I mean, that's, that's the purpose of what you're, you, you, you do as a, as a performance coach is to try to impact someone's life and, and, or their, their sport. Uh, and, uh, it's good, it's good to know that, that people are doing that. And I thank you for that. Yeah, no, no problem. So with that said, you know, with your interviews of all the Olympians and other world-class uh, performers, you stated in your book that, that when asking them how much of their success was the mental game, a majority of them answered 90%, correct? That's right. I mean, if you ask any elite performer, and I, I'll, I'll define elite performer for you. I think elite performer is somebody that, uh, you know, I think 95% of winning is accomplished by 5% of their participants. And th- those are the elite guys. And I know a lot of them. I've interviewed a lot of them. And, uh, and they all say the same thing. If you ask them what percentage of your sport is mental, they're going to tell, give you a big number back. And the number that I get most often is 90%. My sport's 90% mental. And then what's interesting about that is that the next 5%, the 5% underneath them, you can't tell any difference between the next 5%. They don't, don't do any winning. And the top 5%, they use the same equipment. They have the same teachers. They work just as hard. They have the same skills. Their training scores are just as good. But, but there's something missing. And, wh- and what's, what's missing is mental mastery. What's missing is the mental game. And uh, that's, that, that's interesting to me that because, because I was in the top 5% for about three years. Uh, the, 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 the second 5%, I should say. I was in about the, the second 5% for about, for about three years until, until I caught on and, and realized that, whoa. There's a lot to know about this mill game. And, and, and it was a game changer for me. And it moved me from, not only did it move me to the top 5%, but it all, also, when I got really good at it, it moved me to, to a dominant position in my sport for about five or six years. So, so it's, it's interesting to me that everybody thinks it's really important, but uh, when you ask them the second question, well, if you think your sport's 90% mental, since you've been doing it, if you've spent 90% of your time and money on the mental game, you get a very low number back. As a matter of fact, most, most athletes are almost uh, ignoring this. And uh, uh, that just doesn't make sense to me. Uh, but, but I did it too. <laughs> you, know, you start, you, you got to ask yourself the question, so, well, why, why is this true? Well, uh, first of all, there are a lot more technical instructors out there than, than there are mental instructors. Uh, you, you, you don't have to worry about having technical instructors. Even, even in high school, you have technical instructors and everything, you know, basketball coaches, football coaches, but, but, but there are no mental coaches. And you have, uh, you, 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 I didn't take a course on how to think in college. I didn't take a course on how to think in high school. And, uh, and, and, uh, and another reason why there's not that many people teaching the mental game is it's a lot harder to teach mental training than it is to teach form. You, you can demonstrate form. You can, you, can, um, you can video it. You can measure it. Uh, you see that champion see how he's holding the pistol? Hold the pistol like that. But try this. See that champion see how he's thinking? Think like that. 
doesn't work. It, it, it's, there's a science to just finding out how people feel and how people think. And, and uh, the most important parts of the mental game are very, very hard to measure. How do you measure confidence? How do you measure commitment? How do you, you, it's, it's sometimes difficult to get, even, even get an athlete to explain what he's feeling because, because it's not concrete. It's not, well, this is how you spell it. <laughs> so it's, it's, a, uh, it's a little tougher, but it's, it's no less important. And uh, we've tried our best uh, for the last 40 years to try to take the, th the essential information that people need to know and try to make it simple enough to where everybody can use it. And, and that's, that's uh, uh, and the mental game is, is getting more and more attention every year that I've been doing this. One thing that I'll add to that, Lanny, is for some reason, you know, every now and then, myself, my brother, Brian, you know, all the folks that, that we kind of run in circles with, for some reason, you know, we, you know, we really care about helping people. Now, we're nowhere, you know, at the world-class level, um, but, but, you know, we have enough knowledge and, and capabilities to help people. And sometimes when you're trying to pass on, you know, even just fairly simple information, you know, a lot of times you just get folks that, you know, it's just a section of society that they, they're just not interested in, in trying. So I think it's probably way more difficult on the, on the mental side of that. So with that said, Aaron, what you got, buddy? You got a question? Sure. Now going further into your mental management system, will bring up something very important to us, speaking of what Eric and I and others try to pass on to people, is the concept of visualization, or as you term it, rehearsal. Could you describe how this should be executed, uh, you know, what you should see, and other senses or any other um, details that, that can make that process more effective? Well... Rehearsal plays a big, a big role in my system. Uh, we teach that an athlete should rehearse before, the, like say, the tournament day. You've got a tournament day. You're going you're gonna to perform today, whatever application you're doing. If you're a shooter, you're going to shoot today. And uh, that before you even get out of your vehicle before you go on the range, you should be rehearsing something. We teach that you should rehearse how you want to feel today. I want to feel comfortable, calm, in control, confident, bulletproof. I want to control my emotions all day long. I, I, whatever you throw at me, I can handle. If, if you rehearse something that you're, you have to do, that you're about to do, and you rehearse doing it well, you've in, in taken a huge step toward improving the probability that that's going to work. On the other hand, if you're, if, you, if you're thinking this way, well, I don't know if I can shoot good today or not. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I haven't been shooting good recently, and I, I don't know. This is, there's a lot of competition here, and uh, I don't feel all that well. And I, and you you go in with that attitude, you're 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 pretty well toast. So I I would think that's pretty important in in that in that one spot. Uh, we, we teach athletes to run a system where you're you're actually in rehearsal is part of that system for every shot you shoot or every run run you execute. If you're if you're a IDPA shooter, you're gonna you're gonna execute a run, and and so. Uh, it might be a good idea before the run to, to rehearse the run, to rehearse how, how am I going to execute, what, what, what am I going to do, how am I gonna, where am I going to go, how am I gonna, how is this going to work. And, and uh, there's tons of research to show that if you rehearse something before you do it, the probability that you're going to do it well goes up. And, uh, but, but the important thing is to rehearse that you're doing it well. And rehearse that, what does it feel like to do it? Not so much what it looks like to do it. Now, the reason why I like re rehearsal better than visualization is that when you use the term visualization, 
it, 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 the term vision is in there, which, and I think some people, far too many of my clients, when back when I was using visualization, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. If you're using visualization and imagery and, and rehearsal to mean the same thing, it's, it's okay. It's just, they're all, they're all, all, they're all the same thing. But if, but what if you use visualization and say, well, I, 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 I'm a golfer and I see where the ball goes. Well, that's not nearly as 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 uh, effective as what does it feel like to hit the ball that goes there? And what 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 does it feel like? What the uh, for for a rifle shooter for to, for me to to me re- rehearse? I look in the scope and I see and and I see a ten. I just executed a ten. That 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 that's not nearly as effective as as me rehearsing the sight picture coming into place and and feeling the recoil of the of, 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 of the of the firearm or whatever you're shooting or the shotgun and and, and uh, what does it feel like to, to 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 what's the stroke feel like in a shot with with shotgun not so much what you see but what you feel so I like the word rehearsal because I think rehearsal works uh, more to describe what you're you're wanting to do. It's it's like if you're an actor in a play, you rehearse the lines, but you also rehearse the scene or you'd you know so you're it's not just what you're doing, but it's what you how you, the emotions that you're that you're going through to be able to do it effectively. And I the 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 performance at a, at elite levels is 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 closer it's it's a it's a carefully choreographed dance, and if if you if you know any musicians, they'll tell you that that we can all play the notes, but the guys that that get the recording contracts or the guys that that are, are the soloists in the in the orchestras that people come to pay to watch, it they it's not just that they're hitting the notes. It's it's they. It's a choreographed dance with emotion and feeling and everything the way they do it. Okay, so that's what I want to do when I rehearse something. I want to get something out of it. I don't want to just go through the motions. Does that help? Yes, definitely. So, Lanny, I I would like to to also bring into light how this helps uh, some of our clients and our audience members because. Um, you, you may be tracking, you know, we're a tactical show more than anything else. And when I say tactical, sometimes that's a, that could be seen as a pejorative in some ways. But, but our, our focus is self-protection on this show. And what we, we also emphasize, and something that I just wrote in a blog piece, which incidentally is how we kind of got hooked up, is me contacting you about uh, using some quotes in there. So. We also use this rehearsal, you know, in thinking about defensive scenarios, you know, where um, a, a, an instructor of ours, uh, Tom Givens, talks about reading the newspaper and, and these shooting situations or defensive use situations that you can mentally rehearse your response to that. And so, you know, it's kind of interesting. We use it for both sport and we use it for, for that purpose as well. But I would say that years ago when I was serious about IDP, I still am now, but uh, not as much so as I was back then. It, I know that that was a crucial part of my success was the rehearsal before every stage. And something that I've experienced recently, because when I wrote that, that blog post, I had used visualization over the last few years, but I had not used it near as much as I had recently. And there's a part of the process now that I'm noticing is that after I visualize, I try to write it in my log every single day. And when I rehearse through either an IDPA stage or, or a defensive scenario, there's a part of me that I feel like, man, I'm kind of excited that I got that done today because I feel like my abilities improved. And, and sincerely, that's what uh, emotion I feel after executing my, my rehearsal. So 
Would you say that that may be part of that process taking place? Is that kind of excitement after the fact that I got that rehearsal in? Well, yes. Uh, it, what we try, and in, in, in my system, we we don't take anything for granted. We 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 put things in there that uh, a rehearsal actually shows up not only before a, a shot or a stage, but also after a stage. So it's, it's critical to, to, to us. And, and the, the other thing that we do that I see maybe one of the game changers that, that I've seen in, in clients that, that I, they read my books and things like that. And, and I don't have, I, I can't put everything that we teach in, in, in a book, but, uh, one of the things that we we've found in the in recent years that has been important is the the fact that not only do you have to rehearse the shot but you have to commit to the shot. You know, and and it's it it comes very close together in the process in the mental process that we teach. But but uh, to commitment, it, it, the purpose of commitment is to eliminate doubt. Because if you have doubt and you're about to compete, you, or, or if you have doubt in anything that you're about to do, you're pretty much done before you start. And so the commitment step, by, by, by adding a commitment step into the middle process, we, we, we eliminate doubt. And I'll, I'll tell you what, how important this is. The um, elite performers... Uh, they don't have any doubt when 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 they 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 go into a stage. Uh, it, it's 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 totally eliminated before they go in, and and for me, uh, I I had to I had to do that because uh, the the precision of my sport is is uh, is, is pretty pretty refined, and the, and the scores that that you have to shoot to be competitive to get them to get a medal is. You can't make any mistakes. It's 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 uh, and so and I don't have a ta- I don't have any tactical experience at all. I mean I I I've never had a I've never had a target shoot back at me. So but when I do teach tactical uh, folks, when I do teach teach the seals, or I just got through spe- teaching last week, I taught for 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 six hours last week online to a a a, a special tactics. Uh, organization that's uh, on on their way to Afghanistan. So, it it, it when when I'm I'm teaching this, that they're relating to that, and maybe you can relate to that, Eric. But it it's it's the same process though, and I'm concerned about being committed to what you're about to do, and the commitment step is kind of hard to teach. What does it feel like to be committed? Well, my best example of that is for me, it was a feeling like this. I'm going to try to explain this. Was hold my beer and watch this. Uh, <laughs> I got this. You know, send yeah. me in, coach. You know, it's a no-doubt moment. And, and, it, and that no-doubt moment, I believe that no-doubt moment has to come immediately after you rehearse what you have to do. Right before the... the the, the 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 mental program if if you're doing running a mental program the way we teach it 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 because now you're going to execute this task whether it's a stage or run or whatever it is you're going to execute this task there can be no doubt that your strategy that you've rehearsed is the right one and your ability to do it is assured it it's it's uh it's huge because if you have any doubt, you're done. And then after, after wow. and then after the shot, and then after the shot, and after after the run, uh, you know, you're you're in you're eva- in the, what we call the reinforcement phase of a task. Okay, so after a shot, now I need to evaluate what I just did, and I need to reinforce what I did right, and I need to correct what I did wrong, or at least I need to ask myself the question of, okay, what, what do I need to do? What, what, what did I need to do to make it a great shot? You know, if, I, if, I, if it wasn't great, if we hadn't 
if it wasn't done right, well, what what should I have done? And and those kind of imprints on the self-image are what causes self-image to grow or shrink. And if you beat yourself up after a bad shot or a bad stage, then then your self-image shrinks, and that's bad for you. And if you if you every time you think about the solution to a problem, your self-image grows. That's good for you. Every time you think about what you did right, uh, you improve the probability you're going to do it right more often, and that's good for you. So how you handle, and that's all rehearsal. That's, 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 that's a reinforcement of what you just did or reinforcing what you should have done. And, and that's huge. And, and most athletes don't do that at all. They just kind of, okay, I finished that. I'm going to the next one. And they're giving up a huge advantage. And so rehearsal plays a big role in this. It's not the only thing. There's a lot of other things that are, that are really important. I, I, I don't want people to think that, okay, as long as I rehearse my shot, that, that's, not, that's the only mental tool I, I have to use. That would be a mistake. Well, Annie, I believe that that last discussion that we've had regarding m- mental rehearsal, that, that, that goes into another deeper topic that you even mentioned there. It's about eliminating negativity either in your life, in your training, or when you are on the line about ready to execute in your sport. Um, Could you go deeper into that? Yeah, I mean, I think that performance is a function of three mental processes. The conscious mind, what you think about. The subconscious, where your skills are. These are the things you do without having to think about it. And your self-image. The self-image makes you act like you. It's it's your opinion of yourself. Am I? Uh, it's it's your habits and your attitudes and and so uh, uh, that that's the self-image is really what separates the good from the great uh, in the sense that your you self-image in, in the, the way your self-image got where it's at uh, and where it's going to go in the future is dependent upon a thing called imprinting. And, uh, and there's different kinds of imprints. Like if you shoot a good shot, what imprints in your self image is like me to shoot a good shot. If you shoot a bad shot, what imprints in my self image is is I shot a bad shot. So what actually happens is, 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 is a kind of imprint. So we, we tend to look at this as circles, uh, the, the, like a self-image is a circle. So the bigger the circle, the better you do. So the circle gets bigger if you, if you have a lot of good shots. It gets smaller if you have a lot of bad shots. So those are called actual imprints. Also, you, you're affected by the people you're around. So if you're around positive people, you tend to be positive. If you're around negative people, you tend to be negative. So, you're, 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 if you're around, you know, so positive and negativity... Uh, uh, it, you're you're going to move to whatever you're picturing. You're going to, and 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 so then we have these imagined imprints. Like like every time you think about, it, I mean, this this was amazing to me when I discovered this. Every every time you think about uh, getting a ten, you improve the probability you're going to get a ten. Every time you think about messing up, you improve the probability you're going to mess up. So whatever you think about, improve you become you become it. And and so you you if if you what you want to have happen is something negative, keep thinking about it. That that's what's going to happen. You need to think about what you want to have happen. And then I, I there's this idea of talk of uh, you go to go to almost any sport, uh, certainly any shooting sport that I've ever been around. I haven't been around all the sports, but of the sports that I've been around, every single sport I've ever coached or been around, except for one. The people are negative. I, th- I think that it's a negative culture. They live in a negative culture. They, and I'll tell you how you know. You, you just ask people how you're doing and what do they talk about first? Do they talk about what went right or what went wrong? How about, how about IDPA? You go to IDPA tournament, you ask a guy how you're doing. Does he talk about what he did right first or what he did wrong first? Definitely what he did wrong. Now I've been preaching that that's that's wrong for forty years, and and there there are more 
there's a lot of more work for me to do <laughs> because it's still it, it it's the culture of those sports. The one sport that this is not true of that I have personally experienced with is martial arts. Hmm. The martial arts guy, the martial arts guys, don't complain and they don't talk about their the, the, what they did wrong. Near it's it's a it's dramatic difference between. The, the high level martial arts people that I've that I've had the honor to work with, and maybe it's because of the way they're trained. You know, there's a lot more respect in martial arts. That you bow before you get on the on the mat. There's, the, you know, the, you, the senseis don't actually say, "Here's what you're doing wrong." They t- tip, typically always say, "Here's what you're doing right." Here's what you're doing right. So, so the focus is on on the the, the successful execution not on the problem that you had. And so the self-image tends to grow. And I think that's one of the big, huge advantages of, of, of doing martial arts uh, because it, 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 it doesn't have that negative, ne- negative uh, Im- impact that, I mean, shooting sports are terrible. You ask a guy, well, rifle shooters are just terrible at it. You say, well, how did you shoot? Well, it dropped two. Well, you, you you got fifty eight tens, and but you drop two, and that's the one you're going to talk about. And if you're if you're standing around long enough, they'll tell you how they dropped them. So, I'm not saying saying this is true of absolutely everybody, but it is so prevalent that it's noticeable. And and so we, you in, live, live in this negative culture, and you, you I think these people don't realize that your self image is shrinking every time you do that the probability that you're going to have success success in the future is diminished because you are imprinting what you don't want and like journal keeping most people don't keep a journal and, and when you keep a journal and you write down what you did right that, that's that's the strongest form of imprinting that you can get is what you did right if you write in, like we sell a performance journal, and the performance journal is, is set up in such a way that you only write down what you what you learned, what you did good, what you what you what you did, and what you what you learned, and what you did well, and what you're going to do. That that's all that's in that journal. There there's no I'm going to discuss all the problems that I had. And if you can eliminate your your self talk, if you eliminate what you say to other people that's negative, you eliminate your your uh, um, you're complaining about other people, you're complaining about your life. You'll be a lot happier and probably a lot more successful because nobody really really wants to be around a complainer. Now, by the way, if you if you change your life and, and become that person, uh, you may lose some friends. Because I think people like to complain. I think people like to have other people hear them complain. Yeah, that that's an interesting point. I, I, I think we do see that, you know, when people are super positive, people are like, man, I don't like being around. He's too positive all the time, which is kind of sad. Well, Eric, I'd, I would but, like uh, to interject as I was hearing Lanny speak of that, and we're talking about IDPA, and I'll make this real quick. One thing that that irritates me about the negative people at an IDPA match is most often they are the top performers and they run off the line and they're mad about how they shot and they're still outperforming everybody else. Now, maybe this is my own ego, but I don't have a a negative or, or strong ego to be bruised, but to me it's like, okay... You're kind of insulting everybody else around you that's trying to do the best they can. So that that's just one aspect of it that that really sticks out to me when the negativity comes out at a match. So yeah, it is true with shooters for sure. Well, one of one of the things that I have to say about that is that they're keeping the key, they're keeping the negative going by doing that. Mm-hmm. They're, they're setting an example because people are going to copy what the top people are doing. Mm-hmm. Well, but, but I will say that, that, that uh, um, I, have, I have to say that at, at the level that I competed in in shooting, um, and the guys that I ran with, 
at the Army Marksmanship Unit. At the time that we were, the, I was on the team. We had four-person teams. And we went to world championships in a four-person team and so forth. And world records. And when, when I, I was competing with Jack Ryder and Margaret Murdoch and Lonis Wigger, uh, at that time in history, we, we, we held all, all the world records, all of them. And all of us on this team had been world champions. All of us had won Olympic medals. Uh, all of us had won gold medals, except Margaret Murdoch. She won a silver, but she tied me in the Olympics, so they should give her a medal, too, a gold medal, too. I'm not going to get mine, but she tied me, and I won the tie break. <laughs> but, but she deserves that gold medal. I mean, this, this is the quality of shooters. I never heard them complain. I never heard them talk about their bad shots. I mean, and, and I'm just telling you that if your top guys in IDPA are, are, are complaining about their, for the mistakes and throwing hissy fits and things like that, they would be better shooters if they didn't do that. And what I will add is, is I think Aaron um, has probably seen that a little bit at the top, top level. Um, but I would say, Aaron, if, if, if I can get clarity, it's more like the top local and regional guys that you're seeing that from, Most right? certainly. You're not going to see a negative thing come out of Mike Seeklander's mouth, who is the world champion. So, yeah, I, I, that is a good point to make, Eric. Yes, regional level. It's it's sad because because it's uh, it's just it just should not happen and uh, and 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 it and it does and, and you know we're we live in a negatively charged world. I mean, think about what's happening in the world right now. Not not to be political, but you know, you can go to to any time in history that where they had I don't know. At least when they started showing cable news, for sure, for, and, and I don't know too much b before that. But it's it's hard to have uh, open up a newscast and and not see what's what's going bad in the world out there. I mean that that's taught that that makes news for some reason. People are are are, are they they want to know what went wrong. And there are a lot of great things happen. But that doesn't get covered much. But but you know, one guy gets shot, and the whole world wants to know about that. But but a, a, a lot of guys, uh, uh, you know, you had had good performances. You know, I talk about the police or anybody you want to talk about. And that that now now uh, you have thousands and thousands of of, of 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 times when when somebody has helped somebody that doesn't get any any play at all. But one guy screws up, and and everybody wants to talk about that. Well, what we're doing is we're we're improving the probability we're going to have more. So, so I I mean, when, did your mother ever say something like this to you that if you don't have something good to say about somebody, don't say anything at all? Did she say that? Absolutely, yes. Most mothers do. They go, they go to mother school and take these lessons or something. <laughs> I don't know, but they all seem to know. They say all seem to say that, and and but it's true. It's true. Is your life when you're complaining about something, you're improving the probability that somehow or another it's going to be like you to make it continue to happen, and that that's just nuts. But but it, it, it's not said enough by people of authority about how wrong that is. Well, one one thing that I would like to kind of gear this towards, because that was that was such a good discussion on negativity and why we should not be negative, that um, I'll close that portion of the discussion with uh, a, a gentleman that we just had on. Actually, he's who uh, or his show is the one that's currently the, the weekly podcast, I should say, and that's a gentleman named Lachlan Giles. He's from. He's from Australia, and he is one of the biggest up-and-coming superstars in jiu-jitsu. And he just recently, 2019, won a bronze medal in the absolute, or the, actually the, the open weight division at about 170 pounds. I mean, he absolutely did phenomenal. He's a humble guy. No negativity that I'm aware of. You know, I see him interact interact online with some other folks that are that want to be negative and he doesn't turn negative 
But one of the things that that we discussed on our show, we discussed your book, and I and I passed him a link to your book, and he said that he was excited to hear uh, uh, this show when it releases. So, um, maybe with with Lachlan Giles on your program, goodness, he's going to be unstoppable. So. Uh, I, I think he's heading that direction anyway. But uh, anyway, with that said, um, I'd love to have him on my podcast. <laughs> we're, we're starting a podcast, so you guys are having too much fun without us getting in the in the game uh-huh. here. So I would I would love to do that. Uh, well, um, I'll I'll mention that to him. Um, he, he would he would be an excellent guest because I mean he he's definitely one of the top jujitsu competitors in the world right now. So and Eric, I have to add real quick. He won that bronze, which was a nearly impossible task, being his weight and who he was up against. Again, a bronze against every weight division after he had, of course, won all of his other his division. Um, but he has multiple multiple world championships. So just wanted to add that. And in. by the way. By the way, that that um, win that day, that bronze medal, he beat the heavyweight world champion that day. Yeah, the one that had just won the gold medal in the heavyweight division, he beat him. He t- tapped him out with a hill hook. It, it was it was a phenomenal win. With that said, Aaron, uh, you, you want to talk about uh, affirmation with him, and I'll let you just kind of smooth into that. Sure. Now, of course, one of the things that, like Eric said, with I think he mentioned the affirmation statement, but that was definitely something that Mike Brown, again, our pistol coach, keyed us into. I am actually in the same situation where I'm wanting to class up to master in IDPA, and I have a an affirmation ta- statement that I am refining throughout this process. But could you go into that and, and how someone would, you know, in general – how someone would implement that. And I have one question. Maybe I can ask it after you get into it if you don't cover it. Okay, so a directive affirmation is uh, the strongest tool I know to change a person's self-image. Especially if a person has something that's locking them up keeping them from moving forward. Uh, I've seen people that were um, petrified of giving a talk in front of people to be com- very comfortable to, to talk in front of people. I've seen people uh, that uh, the start at tournaments, they just, once they got going, they were okay, but the start was just, just they was just uh, almost out of control at the beginning. Uh, turn into people that look forward to the start, that felt like the start was one of their better better parts of, of, of the game. I've seen people that, uh, that when they get in the lead, they always blow the lead, turn into people that when they get in the lead, you better watch them because they're probably going to extend it. Um, I've, I've had people that, that felt like that their, uh, uh, that one part of their, of their, their sport was just, they just couldn't do that, uh, become world famous in, in, in that particular phase of, of, of their sport. Uh, I've seen people kick drugs. I've seen people stop, stop uh, become non-smokers to, to um, reach the desired weight, all kinds of things happening with, uh, with directive affirmation. So what it is is a um, it, 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 it uses imprinting to change self-image, and so you change the the number of imprints that you have in, in a positive direction. You 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 amplify that. <coughs> you you make that um, you you force that to happen by uh, and writing it out. Uh, in, in, in a paragraph form of the self-image that you want to become. And you have to do it in a, in, in a prescribed manner. If you don't do it right, or if the, if the directive affirmation is not written in the right way, 
it 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 won't work. And and there are a lot of things that that you can't use a directive affirmation for. So it it's 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 um, very important that it's done correctly. And um, so we have. I spent quite a bit of time with the book with Winnie in mind talking about the directive affirmation, but. Uh, uh, it, if it's written correctly, and you write five copies of this of this uh, paragraph of the of the person that you want to become, and you put it in five key points around the house, and and every time you go to that key point, like it could be a bathroom mirror, or refrigerator door, or whatever it is, every time you go to there, you you read and rehearse that paragraph, uh, and you're trying to get ten to fifteen imprints a day. For 21 days, uh, your self-image with that much imprinting is going to change to whatever it is that that you're that you're you're talking about. You're rehearsing, and uh, I've actually never seen it fail. I've seen people not do it correctly and it fail, or or, or you try to do it for something that's not designed for it to do, and and, and it fail. But uh, if the directive affirmation meets the criteria. For a, to be used, then uh, uh, that it works. So that's that's how it works, and uh, uh, it works because of imprinting. Well, L- Lanny, what I would tell you is that I agree with you that that the affirmation or the directive affirmation statement is the most important part of your system, at least from what I've gotten from it, and I know Aaron has gotten so much out of it. So I think if if anybody learns anything from this this discussion is number one, everybody in the audience that wants to perform needs to go right out and and purchase uh, with winning in mind. And they could go to your website for that, right, Lanny? Yeah, so you, you can get it from us at uh, mentalmanagementstore.com. And, uh, I mean, it's available on Kindle. It's available... Uh, you know, and Amazon sells it too. But if if you uh, if you want a signed copy, all you have to do is uh, request on your go to the web go to the millmanagementstore dot com and and just put your name in there, and I'll I'll personalize it and I'll sign it for you. And um, but it's available uh, well, readily available everywhere. So. <laughs> Well, it sounds like I bought mine from the wrong place. <laughs> and, no. and, ah, you, well, you need another one. You need to give yours away. And <laughs> That is an excellent suggestion. The other thing that I, I would tell you that is that uh, there's a lot more information on, develop, on, on directive affirmations that uh, so sometimes people need to see um, – Need 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 training on it, and and if you if if you get on our newsletter, we are developing um, online courses now for that that specifically address that and and how to uh, make sure that uh, the the directive affirmations that you are are uh, writing are correct. The other thing is we certify instructors here. Uh, and I've got a, a certification program for people who actually want to teach mental management. Um, we can actually teach them. And one of the, one of the courses that, wow. that certified instructors actually teach is help, to help people actually write directive affirmations and, and uh, build their self-image and how to, how to change self-image. So there's, there's a lot of different things that are happening uh, beyond um, – just a book, but that's that's certainly a good place to start. Yeah. So then we need to re- reiterate that um, folks need to go pick up your book, and if anybody's interested, they can get direct training from you online for the affirmation statement. And then you guys also just recently started doing uh, video training with clients as well, right? Yeah, what happened to us was that I mean we have not had not done any any online stuff for a long time, but we certainly looked at the advantage of doing it, but we hadn't gotten to it. But when when the COVID situation came about, and people stopped 
stopped uh, flying airplanes and come and come to see us, then we were forced uh, to, to to look at it, and and it, it's high time that we did. So now we actually have. Uh, online courses that people can take, webinars that are running right now. I mean, right now I'm 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 doing a webinar uh, on Tuesday and and uh, next week, uh, just just for coaches and uh, it's for people who who train other people. Uh, then uh, we we have webinars for competitors and uh, we're we're starting to do webinars for the, that are sports specific. Uh, to, uh, we go, got one running, running uh, next month for archery, and then I'll be doing one for for sporting clays. And at some at some point, we're going to do we're going to do uh, sports specific things for practical pistol and, and tactical operations and things like that. So, but you can also get uh, from from us. You can also have have one on one or personalized training online. So that you, you say, okay, this is what I want to know, and, and and okay, here we'll build a program for you, and, and we'll teach you we'll teach you online, because that's that has actually become uh, much more popular for people. Because I don't think people until they most people didn't even know about Zoom. They didn't know that that you know I can go to a computer and I can uh, I can actually look at the instructor, and the instructor can teach me. I mean, the people that have been taking online courses for for at education knew about these things, but. But there's an awful lot of competitors that that uh, they they started communicating and using Zoom uh, to go to church on Zoom or talk to their relatives on Zoom or people like that because they were locked down, and now it's it's become far more uh, acceptable to do this. And um, hey, it'll be a major part of our business from now on because of the way that uh, that's one of the good things that's happened and happened uh, with uh, the COVID thing. And I and I, I I certainly hope nobody's gets this stuff and and uh, hope that you're safe and but uh, that that's that's what we're we're starting starting to do now. So there's a lot of different opportunities and and, uh, and you know if anybody wants to communicate communicate with me, well then, you know I'd, I'd be happy to send you out all the information that we've got. We've got uh, we got a special. Um, um, Special group uh, that we that we communicate with that that's just interested in online stuff. You know, they're especially international clients. So if you just send me an email at Lanny at mentalmanagement dot com, uh, I'll be happy to get you on that list, and so that you'll you'll get it or watch our newsletter. Um, if, if you just request a newsletter at, at uh, info at mentalmanagement dot com or or, or Write me at Lanny at mentalmanagement.com. Uh, we'll make sure that you get on a newsletter. All everything we do comes out on a newsletter monthly. But uh, we we do have uh, for folks that are that are wanting to be get the very earliest information on online training. We have a special um, a special group a list that we we let them know first, and sometimes there's discounts. Well, Lanny, we will definitely have all of that information on the show notes. So if folks out in the audience didn't get a chance to write that down, we'll have that in there uh, on the show notes. So I think, Lanny, you have been an incredible guest. Uh, It it was uh, much more than we had anticipated. We knew it was going to be great. But we also believe that we're going to have audience members out there that are going to benefit uh, tenfold by, um, you know, gaining your book and getting information from you and communicating with your company. So we thank you so much for coming on the show. Stay safe over there and uh, come home safe and, and thank you for your service. And, uh, not, you, you know, you got to know that a lot of people in this country are praying for you guys. You. We, we want your home safe. Well, thank you very much, Lanny. Aaron, you want to go ahead and take us out? Sure, Lanny. We'd like to let you go and and let you get ready for your day. I'm sure you have plenty to do and plenty of instruction to take care of. So again, just thank you so much. My pleasure. Well, another amazing interview there with an amazing, amazing mind. 
Um, the fact that uh, Lanny can do what he has done and achieve what he has achieved and then turn around and give us the tools to achieve it ourselves, that's that's an exceptional human being right there. So I really want to thank him for coming on the show, even though I couldn't be in the interview. It was really, uh, it was a, a little heartbreaking to not be able to make that night, but we weren't going to reschedule. We needed to make the interview go off, and I think uh, those guys did a great job. So we appreciate that, Aaron. But uh, I'm going to move us right into the accountability section. I uh, got after it in the gym last week, man. I uh, I am so happy to be back in a live gym with live bodies and a coach and and just pushing and being able to to do that in a group scenario because I feel like I do push myself harder than when I work alone. And that's kind of the same thing, same reasoning that we use here. You know, we're, we're using this accountability to push each other. The accountability I have to the people I see in class daily, the same people, the people I know doing my benchmark, doing the weight I should be doing, doing the reps I should be doing. It really makes a difference. Um, Even though I worked out all through our COVID lockdown, which is not even over here in Washington, we're lucky to be in the gym at all. We have reduced class class sizes and some, you know, restrictions about, you know, contact, but it is so cool. I actually got six workouts in, five were CrossFit workouts and one barbell workout. Man. I even got a nice barbell bruise on my back from doing uh, push presses behind the neck, which I don't know if I've ever done that bruise before. I've done plenty of that movement, but uh, <laughs> I noticed it hopping out of the shower. I'm like, what? What? what is on my back? <laughs> um, and then, of course, the other thing that I've been doing that uh, I'll, I'll probably keep checking in on accountability on is the uh, I'm, I'm learning to be a private pilot. And I've really kind of been using the time that I can't go to jujitsu to do that. Because I used to go to jiu-jitsu two to three times a week, and that is what I'm trying to do now is to fly two to three times a week until I have my hours and contest. And uh, I actually flew for five hours last week, which is cool because we usually only do, you know, between one and a half and two hours per flight. So I got three flights in and got to do some really cool maneuvers and takeoffs and landings and, you know. I don't think I scared my instructor more than once or twice, so that was a that was a bonus. <laughs> but uh, he's a brave man to fly with me, I'll tell you that. <laughs> um, but I did get to the range and uh, shoot the drill live again. The drill was the uh, two targets on transition, two IDPA targets, uh, one yard apart, and it was uh, one and one, two and two, and three and three, and your your combined seconds for the the three strings were your score. And um, I shot it in 1153. I was really happy with that. And the best part was that I shot it clean. And like Aaron has mentioned in the past, um, we usually, I, I did it three times and I did miss on the first stage. I shot it clean on the second. And on the third go through, I pushed myself and I did drop two shots. Man, they were just outside the punchlines on the paper too. It's like so close, but it was it was cool to see where my break point was. And just to bring up another thing about uh, we're gonna we're gonna talk about this in detail, I think, in a host only show coming up. But uh, I did adjust the sights on my the Glock 19 that I've been training with, and. Although it's not my primary carry gun, it is it is the gun I would carry if I chose to carry something larger than the somewhat bug unit that I normally carry. But I've been fighting sights that weren't correct. And let me mm-hmm. tell you guys, we got a lot of new people with firearms in the industry, in the market, you know, right now. Guns are not accurate out of the box. There are times that you got to change things, and you may have to change them by more than you think. I... Uh, had to run my sight almost to the left edge of the slide. And that is not, that's not a problem. That's where it needs to be to be accurate. So um, anyway, now, shooting much you, better. What sights are you running? So I'm running the Trigicon, just the standard Trigicon night sights. So they have a, a white appearance in daytime and their green glow at night. So, cool. Yeah, nothing, not, no target sights. They're, they're combat sights, you know, awesome. and that's, that's what I want to train with because that's what I'm going to carry. Um, I definitely have gaming pistols that with like a Dawson or something on the front, and that makes a huge difference. But 
I'm not going to put that on a combat gun because yeah. those are fragile. Yeah. Now, um, you said you kind of carry a bug bug out, or excuse me, a bug gun. Is yeah. that your 365? Yeah, and that's what I would refer to as a subcompact pistol. You know, and something very slim and very small. And for my daytime career, it's uh, a little more conducive to have something with a lower profile, but I don't mind carrying the 19 all the time, honestly. It's very comfortable in that Velo, and it has never given me problems. Um, even flying in the plane doesn't cause a problem at all and uh, doesn't bother me. Um, if I sit somewhere for a very long time, sometimes I'll get a little, you know, impression in my pelvis from the appendix carry, but it's got to be, it's got to be in an hour or two, not, not just, you know, sitting down. That doesn't bother me a bit, but so I did get some stuff done this week. I feel good about what I accomplished, man. So how about you? Well, I was just going to say that on that note about appendix carry, it, it is a system like we've talked about before. And, but there are a lot of things that you can do to make it more comfortable one of those things is to have a proper holster. And, of course, that Velo is one of those holsters yeah, that fits absolutely. that. And, and I'll tell you, another thing that, that I don't know if I've talked about this or not, but um, I'll be honest, I was a briefs guy for a long time, and I recently switched to the um, Under Armour compression shorts, and that is a huge help in not getting hot spots on your leg. I yep. mean, humongous. Yep. S- same thing with the Under Armour um, undershirt, another compression shirt. I, all that stuff I learned from Spencer Keepers. Now, it, I'm sure you love that stuff, and it fits good. But bear in mind, Origin carries that stuff too. Man, I, <laughs> you're right. I, I need to check out what they have too. It, so they've yeah, got. They some, do have the. They do have the uh, compression shorts. Yeah. Oh, I need to check that out because I bet you it's a little bit higher quality than even Under Armour. I'm just gonna yeah t- take a bet on that. And well, it was made here. That's true. That's true. Well, that's awesome. Thanks for the tip, Brian. Now I'm going to go ahead and get into my accountability. So I had. Um, two jujitsu classes. Oh, by the way, so that, that's awesome about you being able to get to your gym, um, Brian. I yeah, know you've been I'm, itching. I'm still to, jealous that you get to go to jujitsu and I don't. But hey. yeah, well, there's some stuff kind of brewing here that I'm a little bit nervous about. Maybe we'll talk about that on another show. But okay, for now, yeah, I got to go to two jits classes. One was um, one was our fundamental class, and then I went to the intermediate or what we call a reflex class um, with my wife, which is awesome. Uh, you'll hear me say that, that she helps me a lot because she's really good, knows her stuff. And recall that I went ahead and kind of swapped my main focus back to jiu-jitsu because I'm further along in, ready to te- in being ready to test than I thought I was, so I'm really kicking it up a notch. Do, you know, I'm spending every day kind of studying all the techniques and then watching the test videos over and over again. I I was just doing that earlier, doing a little bit of jujitsu dry fire. So, yeah, so two JIT sessions. It was great. Felt good after those. And now I have not live fired in two weeks because I ran out of ammo. This ammo. Ah. Yeah, I mean, this ammo situation stinks. But I really do. I've got a great friend that had was able to source about 500 rounds for me, and um, I'm waiting on that and looking forward to getting to go shoot this weekend. I missed IDPA last weekend because I didn't have ammo too. But again, I'm I'm going to be back in the game now. So now, dry fire. I've kind of slipped off on that a little bit because of my jujitsu. Um, I, and a few other things I, I've kind of I've actually I'm embarrassed to say I forgot to dry fire a few days this week so yeah I'm going to step that back up again now one thing if, um, going back to the interview with Lenny Basham that we talked about the affirmation statements I finally went ahead and did an affirmation statement to go ahead and finish losing the 10 pounds I've been talking about for a couple months here. Nice. Um, Yeah, I have a deadline of um, 
of 729, that's one thing you'll learn is, is these affirmation statements must have a deadline. And that's what I set for me. And I believe I'm going to go ahead and make that. So, but you know what? That is all I have for this week. Now, Brian, I think we need to talk about the drill of the week. I, you know, since I didn't get to do the drill, what do you think we just go ahead and repeat that this week and, and give me the benefit of that? Well, there's there's two things there. Um, I don't think there's a problem repeating it because I want to work on getting that time clean under 10 seconds. But one thing, and we can we can kind of go with this how you like, I would also like to step that up because this is kind of, as we do these with progressions, you know. Yeah. Um, one, I would recommend retesting. Retest that this week. Do it again and see if you do it as well or better as you did last week, just so you know where you're at. Now, re- um, refresh our, our um, listeners' yep. memory on that. Yep. So we're going to take two IDPA targets or or anything with a six six inch, uh, excuse me, eight inch center bull, you know, and that's just the center ring on an IDPA, the center circle. Um, we're looking for the zero down, you know, portion there in the middle. And we're going to set those a yard apart. And uh, the, the intent is a yard between the targets. But, you know, hey, let's let's be realistic. Don't don't worry too much about that. But um, so you're going to from concealment timer goes off. You're going to draw, put one round in the center on each of those targets. Reholster starts your second string, and you're going to put two rounds in each circle. And again, reholster, and then you're going to draw and put three rounds in each hole. And the tendency for me anyway to watch out for is getting sloppy with those second and third shots, feeling like you're on target and jerking the trigger. And that's that's what exactly what I did, and I put a couple... Um, I put a couple low and I put a couple just left because the gun was not completely settled when I let, when I let the follow-up shots go. Most of my initial shots were actually really good, but I'd encourage you to shoot it several times and, and take your time before you push it. Because just like we were talking about, and Lanny talks about learning to do it properly and doing it smoothly is what will allow you to then increase your speed it becomes more subconscious. You become automatic with it, but uh, and, you know, and you also get, especially when you're going slow enough to get your perfection in. You're imprinting that positive exactly. experience, exactly, and it, exactly. so exactly it, it gets to you. Allow yourself, and your subconscious starts going. It's like me to shoot this drill clean. So, exactly. So exactly. Again. I am very good at shooting this drill clean. I am. Awesome. And, it, and I have to I have to remember that and I have to tell myself that when I'm doing it. Now the the second thing I would like to try is um, doing basically the same thing, but we're gonna shoot and I I wanna do it three times through so that you're doing the repetition, getting the round the reps in, you know, and again we we're doing lower round count drills on purpose because we know a lot of people are having an issue with ammo right now. So we're, we're trying not to do, you know, 50, 100 round burners, you know, but we're going to use the same targets, but we're going to get two in the body, one in the head, transition to the other target, two in the body, one in the head. And for that one, I, I'm not really looking to add three times together. I want you to do it more than once though. And look, look for your best time on that. And that is basically, that is a failure drill is what that's called. So two to the body, one to the head box, but make them count. And that's the biggest deal is getting that positive mental impression of putting those bullets right where you want. And I would highly recommend, like Aaron talks about, shoot it dry fire first. Yeah. At least twice, at least twice. If you have a laser cert or a training gun, even better. Do it with that because then you're not having to deal with racking the gun to 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 get your trigger set, you know. Um, that's always a little odd when you're training a drill and you're racking the slide, pop, racking the slide, pop. Um, so definitely dry fire it. And even if you're not resetting your trigger, go through the motions dry fire 
because what you want to do is get your brain used to seeing that sight picture where you get that perfect release. Because ideally, those, and this is five yards, this is close. Um, we're going to start backing up here soon on some of these drills. But the whole point is to get like those two shots in the body, those really should be about an inch apart. They should both be right in the center of that circle. And you want that shot in the head box to be well inside the margins. You know, with this isn't, we're, we're not worrying about trying to measure to get it dead center, but we don't want to be a half inch from the edge either. This is only five yards. This is not that hard. But if you try and go too fast, you will drop bullets out. And there is no way that you can shoot fast enough to overcome misses. It yeah. just does not work. And that's, that's, a, that's a, a thing you learn in gaming. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I wanted to add one more thing. Um, the dry fire is awesome. I've definitely, excuse me, I've definitely done that. But I think we should also, again, on the theme of, of our awesome guest on this show, go ahead and re- after you do the dry fire, rehearse through it mentally uh, two, three, four times or whatever you're comfortable with. But take some practice at that. So there you do it, do five reps dry and then do five reps rehearsed. That's not going to take you much time. And then hit it, hit it with the live fire. Just, yeah. just try that out. Just try that out. Um, and, and it's, it, it, it's there's again, like we talked about, the dry fire can be just as important, if not more important, than the live fire in training your brain to get the right sight picture. Mm-hmm. So it's especially in times of short ammo shortage. Why not take advantage of that? Mm-hmm. And that's something that we're going to talk about in another show as well is uh, the importance of dry fire and why why we should be doing it. We've talked about it before, but we're going to bring it up again because I think it's something that we uh, we definitely may have people who have not listened or heard, but it's something I need to be reminded of because it's real glorious to go out there and punch a bunch of holes, but there's not a lot of glory in sitting there with a gun that's not firing, but that's that's important to train that way. And anyone who trains and wins at any type of competition level, if you talk to them, they dry fire. Oh, yeah. And they dry fire a lot. They dry fire more than they shoot. And, you know, yeah. if if you, someone is amazing, and, and I'll just say it, man, he's inhuman. Ben Stoger. He's mm-hmm. got a he's got that book that I recently got and Eric talked about. Um, forgive me what the name of the book is. Let's see here. Dry Fire Training was uh, his uh, first book, and Dry Fire Reloaded was the the second one. And then he's also got Practical Pistol uh, Fundamentals book, Fundamental Techniques and Competition Skills that uh, was actually um, before the Dry Fire book. Um, so he's got a few of them out there that are just loaded with information about how to become a better shooter good stuff good stuff yeah well all right i think that's all we have for this show what, what do you think brian well i'm gonna call it a wrap man i think it's been awesome so i hope you got something out of it yeah yeah we hope you guys did get something out of it and thanks again for choosing to listen to our show we really appreciate it well until right. next time all right good night <laughs>